Luke 23 verses 32 to 34 says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Good morning, First Christian Church. It is so good to be here today. I see a lot of new faces. I see old faces. It is so great to have you here today. For those that don't know me, my name is Steve Erda. I am one of the elders here. I have been uh, preaching for the last nine months or so since we've been without a uh, pastor. Uh, but starting June 1st, we have an interim pastor that's going to be coming in and leading us for a, for a while until we're able to hire the next person that is going to lead the church. I know Bernie mentioned a little bit about that last week. Week, so I just wanted to uh, remind you of that. If you're watching online, welcome. We'd like to thank you for being here. If you're visiting with us today, you'll find a connection card in front of you. Love for you to have an opportunity to just fill that out. You can hand it to me at the end of the service, and we will also have a small uh, gift for you. And I personally want to thank Michael Hay and Bernie Frank for preaching the month of April, giving me some time off, giving me some time to rest. Also, giving my wife and I some time to have a little vacation. Uh, went to see our grandchildren, went to see some friends in Virginia and in North Carolina. So we had a, a nice uh, time off. So with that, let me just pray, and then we'll go ahead and start our message today. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for this room, Lord. We thank you for your presence here, Lord. We thank you for your spirit that has already filled this room, Lord God. And we just praise your name for that, Lord. And I just pray that you touch each and every person in this room today with your message and with your words, Lord. May your hand be upon each and every one of us, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're going to start a brand new series. It's called The Power of Words. It's going to be a four-part series, and we're going to look at the final words and actions of Jesus on the cross. You know, the last words that a person utters can have an importance and somewhat long-lasting significance for the loved ones. And I just want to give you one uh, example. Rosebud. How many of you know the movie? Citizen Kane. A lot of no hands. I'm surprised it's one of the greatest movies ever made. And that word there is the very first opening scene of the movie. The remaining two and a half hours of the film is trying to figure out what Rosebud is. And it's all about the life of this man, Citizen Kane, and how he grew up and how he went from rags to riches and all the things out. And it turns out the only memory he had that was, that was wealth, welcome for him to remember was his childhood sled called Rosebud. You don't learn that until the very last scene of the movie. Great movie. If you have movie buff, go ahead and check that out. So as we look at this, loved ones... They stand close to us. They're quiet, but they don't want to miss those final words. I remember a good friend of mine who passed away in 1991, and I was uh, by her side the day before she passed away, and she said some things to me that I still have not forgotten. We want to hear those last words of somebody, so we listen closely. But there were never any other words said just before a person died that were more important than the words that Jesus said on the cross. So over this four-part series, we're going to look at four things that Jesus said or was talking about. And the first one for today is going to be, I forgive you. The second one is, I take you. Third, I am with you. And the fourth, I told you so. You might have had a hard time figuring that one out, but we'll get to that in, on the Memorial Day weekend. So if you're going to be around Memorial Day weekend, that's going to be the topic for the day. So today we're going to look at I forgive you. How hard is it for you to forgive someone? Are you still holding ill feelings 
to somebody that maybe hurt you? I forgive you is probably one of the hardest things for us to say. But forgiveness is not about being right or wrong. All we need to do is recognize that we are in need of forgiveness. But at the same time, we also need to forgive others. Now, when Anna Marie and I uh, lived in Germany, uh, we had the opportunity to go and visit a German concentration camp called Dachau. I might have mentioned this once before, but it was the 1970s. We walked into this concentration camp, and as soon as you walked through that gate, you felt the despair. You felt the anguish of the people that were there. Even in the 1950s, the people that lived there said they could still smell the crematoriums. But today I want to look at another concentration camp. I just want to mention something that a, when the camp was, re, uh, was liberated, this is the concentration camp called Ravensbrück, and when Ravensbrück was, um, was liberated, they found a crumpled up piece of paper around the belongings of some of the people that lived there. And this happened to be a women's camp, and there were 50,000 women executed at this camp during this time. But listen to the words of this piece of paper that was found on the floor of this concentration camp. O oh Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill, but also those of ill will. But do not remember the suffering that they have inflicted upon us. Remember the fruits we brought thanks to this suffering, our camaraderie, our loyalty, our humility, the courage, the generosity, the greatness of heart which, we have gr that which has grown out of this. And when there comes the judgment, let all the fruits that we have borne be their forgiveness. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being one of those women, tortured, most likely raped, put into this concentration camp and killed, having enough forgiveness in their heart to ask God to forgive them, these people that did this to them? Can you imagine having all of that in your heart? That is what Jesus calls us to do. I mean, I can't imagine the fear and the pain that were inflicted on these women, but they still forgave their captors. She did the unthinkable thing. She sought out forgiveness for their, her, her oppressors. Those are very impressive words, and they pale in comparison to the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. When Jesus was performing his greatest works, speaking his greatest words, after being wrongly accused, being mocked, being beaten, being whipped, humiliated, because the people said, crucify him, crucify him, and they're with him on the cross, were two criminals. We just heard that in our opening uh, passage this morning. Six hours passed from the time that first hammer went into the nail to the time Jesus said, it is finished, and bowed his head. And during those six hours, he spoke seven times. We call these his final words because unlike any other person, <coughs> they weren't worried, they weren't his final words because he got to speak again because he rose from the dead, and he still speaks to each and every one of us today. So in our modern world, with our modern problems like terrorism, economic uncertainty, people mock and say, what is so important about a Roman cross and a Roman crucifixion? What does that have to do with us today? I can tell you it has a lot to do with us today. First, let's understand what a Roman crucifixion was. It was extremely painful. Has any of you ever been in excruciating pain? Maybe you were in surgery. Maybe you have a really bad toothache. Maybe, uh, maybe you had a surgery. Uh, who knows what happened? A broken limb. It hurts. It really hurts. And today we have medication. We'll give you oxycodone. They'll give you anything to take the pain away. Jesus didn't have any of that. Matter of fact, he specifically said no to the sponge with the myrrh on it, which was an anesthetic. 
He said no because he wanted to feel everything. Some of you may have chronic pain. Excruciating pain is unbearable, horrible. Sometimes it will even make you pass out. That's why many forms of torture have been moved, pulled away by the uh, Geneva Convention. But crucifixion is by far one of the worst forms of capital punishment. And the word excruciating that I keep talking about, it means from the cross. That's the origin of that word. They didn't have a word to explain the pain that crucifixion caused, so they created one. And they came up with excruciating from the cross. So the next time you think you're in excruciating pain, remember, it was far worse for Jesus on the cross. You know, in the, uh, Luke 23, one of the first things that we're going to look at today, our, our wor words for this week, is that Jesus said, Father, forgive them, because they know not what they are doing. Do we understand what is happening here? First notice that Jesus is not asking for forgiveness. He's asking God to forgive them. Who is them? Was it the Jews? Maybe it was the Roman soldiers that crucified him. No. Know who the them was? Every person sitting in this room and me. That's who the them is. We discussed this on Easter Sunday. When Jesus died, he was not only the Passover lamb, but he was the Lamb of Atonement from Yom Kippur. He was to take away all of mankind's sins. And that is what Jesus did on the cross. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold, so you have to bear with me today. Uh, we're going to be looking at this passage uh, a couple of times today. So it has to do with uh, verses 11 through 21. First, Paul says here in 2 Corinthians that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So when he says there's no sin to be sin for us, if you look at some other translation, it'll actually be sin offering. Jesus not only became sin, he became the sin offering for us. And that's where that Yom Kippur uh, lamb and the Passover uh, lamb come in. So um, as you're going through that, we have the opportunity for those of us that are believe in Christ and are baptized in his name to be reconciled with God because of Jesus' death on the cross. Paul calls this the ministry of reconciliation. This is one of Paul's main points in this chapter of 2 Corinthians, that Christ had to die on the cross so that through his death we might be reconciled with God the Father. Now, according to my Bible dictionary that I had at home, reconciliation is a change in relationship between God and man based on the change of status of man through the redemptive works of the cross. So our relationship with God is changed because of Christ's death on the cross. We no longer are separated by that chasm of sin and the cross. We now can join God just as it was originally intended to in the, God, in the garden. Notice that God is not changing, but it's our relationship with God that is changing because of the work on the cross. So when Jesus said, forgive them, Jesus was setting up the ministry of reconciliation so that we could be once again united with the Father, and it was always meant to be. This is all great. We could stop right here, end the message, and I could just turn you, send you all home and understand that God forgives you. But it's not that easy. The ministry of reconciliation has a lot more to do with that. Let's look at the um, next uh, passage in verse uh, 19. This is from 2 Corinthians 5 again. That God was reconciling, reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting the people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God has committed to us the message 
of reconciliation, which means we now have a responsibility to reconcile ourselves to others. Those are the people that we don't like. Those are the people that we don't want to associate, associate with. Those are the people that hurt us. God still wants us to reconcile with them because we are Christ's ambassadors. Take a look at verse 20 there. <clears throat> so that God says that we implore others on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. In other words, we have to treat others the same way that God treated us. We are not, we're supposed to draw people to us, not repel them from us. That is the message of reconciliation. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only in this so that but we also might boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Because we have received reconciliation, we get to boast. But what does that mean? We can say that God forgave me. God forgave you. And what does that tell the people around us that they can forgive him, them too. So when we're talking to our friends and relatives that don't know Christ, we have to talk about us and what God has done in our lives so that he can do the same thing in their lives. That's what we talk about grace. God, grace abounds in all of us. That means we have to treat others by forgiving them. I know that's a hard word. It's difficult for us to do, but Christ commands it of us. Now, I started this message today by asking you a few questions about uh, forgiveness and how difficult it might be. And I, we said that it's not easy and it's downright difficult. Some of us hold grudges for a very long time. I'll, I'll give you an example. I have a sister-in-law. My brother died in 2002. And at that time, I was helping her with her finances, trying to make sure that she was able to have a comfortable living. Uh, my brother did not earn a great deal of income, so Social Security from him was extremely low, but I helped her get social security disability insurance. Uh, she had been injured on a job. I helped her get a pension from her work. She thought she didn't deserve one because she hadn't worked 20 years yet. She worked 19 and a half. Uh, so, but, so I helped her get all these things, uh, while I was helping her through all of this. Uh, and that I did that. Now this is some 20 years ago, well, more than that now, but then I did the unthinkable thing. Helping her with her finances wasn't enough. I had to say these words. Why don't you move in with your mother? Can you imagine saying those things to somebody? It was horrible. It was horrible. Do you realize she hasn't spoken to me since? Because I said that. You know where she's living right now? In her mother's house. She waited for her mother to pass away and then she moved back into her mother's house. So... But because she just was a type of person that couldn't forgive somebody, regardless of how small and insignificant it was. She didn't come to my children's weddings. She didn't, uh, every time we reached out to her for birthday parties. Uh, but every so once in a while, she'll mention a small post on Facebook or something. But that's about it. By the way, I didn't find that out until almost 15 years later when my other sister-in-law told me that's what she was mad at. But... <clears throat> So not forgiving someone can lead to hopelessness, despair, lost relationships. But on the contrary, when you do offer forgiveness, it can lead to hope, happiness, rekindled relationships. So in preparing for this message, I wanted to do some research and trying to find out what I could about the medical implications of forgiveness or lack thereof. And I came across this article uh, from the Mayo Clinic. And I got to tell you, this article was so impactful and so powerful, I didn't use it for research. I decided to read you the entire article, which will take up the majority of the rest of our message today. So um, the Mayo Clinic starts out, and the title of this article is Forgiveness, Letting Go of Grudges and Bitterness. 
When someone you care about hurts you, you can hold on to the anger and resentment or embrace forgiveness and move forward. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if these are doctors or members of the staff, but it's, the article says written by members of the Mayo Clinic staff. <clears throat> so the article begins with, who hasn't been hurt by actions or words of another? Perhaps a parent constantly criticized you growing up. A colleague sabotaged you for a promotion. You were protected of your partner who had an affair. Maybe you had a traumatic experience, such as a physical or emotional abuse that someone put on you. Those wounds can leave lasting feelings of resentment, bitterness, anger, and sometimes even hatred. But if you hold on to the pain, you might be the one who pays the most dearly. Now, there's a couple of ad-libs in here by me, and remember, these are doctors, nurses that are putting this together. By embracing forgiveness, you also can embrace and consider how forgiveness can lead you down the path of physical, emotional, spiritual well-being. If you forgive somebody, you can have spiritual well-being. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness means different things to different people, but in general, it involves an intentional decision to let go of resentment and anger. The act of hurt or offending that offended you might always be with you, but working on forgiveness can lessen the act and the grip on you. Think about this picture. Obviously, you can tell it's a picture of a scar. So this is an example. I want to give you an idea of what forgiveness can really mean. Now, we all know what a scar is. My wife has a couple of scars from two hips and two knee replacements. Bernie has a uh, knee replacement. Brenda has had some. Uh, Daryl has had some. Many of you have scars of different kinds. You can see the scar. You can touch it. Some are very painful but you still have that scar. I have a scar on my knee right here. I know exactly when it happened. I was fighting with my brother. We were probably maybe 12 years old. We were wrestling on the lawn of my friend's house. And all of a sudden I felt, I was, as we were wrestling, I felt this excruciating pain. There's that word excruciating again. And I looked down at my leg and there's blood going everywhere. So I run home to my house and my father said, what were you doing, fighting with your brother again? I said, yes. So he said, all right, well, you're not going to the doctor. We're just going to throw some BFI powder on it. And for those of you who have any time, spent any time in the military, you know exactly what BFI powder is. It doesn't exactly tickle. Uh, it can cause a little bit of pain. But my father did that, put a couple of Band-Aids on it, and said, go off. Now, I probably could have used a dozen stitches. That's how big the scar is. But my father said, that's it. That's all you get. Point is, you have the scar, but when you forgive somebody... The pain is gone. You can still see the physical evidence of the scar, but the pain is no longer there. You remember the hurt, the anger, but there is no more pain. That is what forgiveness truly means. If you forgive somebody, all the hurt, all the anger, all of that goes away. You might still remember a little bit about what happens, but you forgot about it. It doesn't matter anymore. You might just have a little physical evidence of what was left behind. Well, let's go back to the article now. So forgiveness can help you free you from the control of the person that harmed you. Let me repeat that. Forgiveness can help you free you from the control of the person that harmed you harmed you. Sometimes forgiveness might even lead to feeling, feelings of understanding, empathy, compassion for the one who hurt you. Now, sometimes that's difficult. You might realize that you might not feel empathy for somebody, but if you truly forgive them, you might start to feel sorry for them. I know that some people in this room are dealing with a great deal of pain right now, but still we need to forgive. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting or excusing the harm done to you. 
It also doesn't necessarily mean making up with the person who caused you the harm. Forgiveness brings a kind of peace that allows you to focus on yourself, to go on with your life. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7, Rejoice in the Lord always, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guide your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Paul is telling us not to worry, to have a gentle spirit. Ask God to cleanse your heart, thanking him in advance for what he is about to do. Then he will protect you and your heart. So according to the Mayo Clinic, what are the benefits of forgiving someone? Letting go of grudges and bitterness can make way for improved health, peace of mind. Forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships, improved mental health, less anxiety, less stress, less hostility, fewer symptoms of depression, lower blood pressure, a stronger immune system, improved, improved health, hearty, uh, improved heart health, improved self-esteem. How many of us need those things? That's what forgiveness can give you. But why is it so easy to hold on to a grudge? Being hurt by somebody, particularly someone you love and trust, can cause anger, sadness, and confusion. If you dwell on the hurtful events and situations and the grudges filled with resentment and hostility, they will take root in your body and they will start to drag you down. If you allow negative feelings to crowd out positive feelings, you might find yourself swallowed up by bitterness or a sense of injustice. Some people are naturally more forgiving than others, but even if you tend to hold on to a grudge, almost anyone can learn to be more forgiving. So what are the effects of holding on to this grudge? If you struggle with finding give forgiveness, you might bring anger and bitterness into a new relationship and experiences. Become so wrapped up in the wrong that you can't enjoy the present. Sound familiar to anyone? Become depressed, irritable, anxious. Feel at odds with your spiritual beliefs. Loss valuable and enriching connections with other people. So how do we improve this state of forgiveness? Forgiveness is a commitment to change. It takes practice. To move towards forgiveness, this is where that reconciliation comes in that we were talking about earlier. You might recognize the value of forgiveness and how it improves your life. And identify what needs healing and who you want to forgive. Join a support group. See a counselor. Acknowledge that the emotions you have harm and the harm that was done to you. Recognize how these emotions affect your behavior and work to release them. Choose to forgive the person that offended you. Release control and the power that the offending person in that situation is holding on your life. So what happens if you can't forgive someone? <clears throat> As I said, forgiveness can be hard, especially if the person who you hurt isn't admitting that they did anything wrong. You find yourself stuck. You need to practice empathy. Try seeing the situation from the other person's point of view. Ask yourself the circumstances that may have led up to the behavior that hurt you. Perhaps you would have reacted similarly if you were in the same situation. Reflect on the times when, the others, when others have forgiven you 
Again, Jesus forgave you, therefore we have to forgive others. Write in a journal. Use a guided meditation. Talk to a person that you found to be wise and compassionate on these things, such as your spiritual leader, mental health provider, or an impartial loved one or friend. Be aware that forgiveness is a process. It doesn't just happen like that overnight. Even small hurts may need to be revisited and forgiven again and again. Now, does forgiveness guarantee reconciliation? If the hurtful event involved someone whose relationship you, va you value, forgiveness may lead to reconciliation, but it's not always the case. Reconciliation may be impossible if somebody has died or is unwilling to change or communicate with you. In other cases, reconciliation might not even be appropriate. If you are a child and you are hurt as a child by this person, you may not want to revisit that pain again. Still, forgiveness is possible, even if reconciliation isn't. But remember, if that person finds Christ, you'll be reconciled with them in heaven. So what if the person that I'm forgiving doesn't want to change? Getting to, know a per getting to uh, another person to change isn't the point of forgiveness. We don't forgive people in order to get them to change. We forgive people because it's part of our healing inside. It's about focusing on what you can control in the here and now. Think about forgiveness, more about how it can be changing your life by bringing you peace, happiness, and emotional and spiritual healing. Forgiveness can take away the power that that other person holds in you. That's the third time I've said that. Just reading through this, I'm just recognizing that. That's how important this is. We don't want that offending person to have control of our lives anymore. It's time to release it and get rid of it. So what if I'm the one who needs forgiveness? Well, the first one is to honestly access, access, access and acknowledge the wrongs that you have done to other people. Seek them out and ask them to forgive you. Avoid judging yourself too harshly for what you've done. Seek God's forgiveness. Remember, Jesus died on the cross to forgive us. If you're truly about something you've said or done and want for, for, uh, forgiveness, consider reaching out to the person that you harmed. Speak, of you, uh, speak to them in sincere sorrow and regret. Ask for forgiveness, and here's a key point, without making excuses. I did it because you don't understand. This is what I was going through. Those are all excuses. Just say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. But you can't force somebody to forgive you. Others need to move to the forgiveness in their own time. Remember, forgiveness is a process. Whatever happens, commit to treating others with compassion, empathy, and respect. To me, it almost sounds like the people that wrote this article were Christians. 98.5%, let's say, of that was written by the Mayo Clinic. Very little of it, other than the scripture verses, were added by me. It's a very powerful article. If anybody needs a copy of that, let me know and I can send you the link to it. So as we uh, get ready to conclude here today, I have one more thing that I really want to talk about, and it comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray. And pay very specific attention to verse 12 here. This comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. And go ahead, and you can go ahead and uh, say this with me here. This then is how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This day...
Forgive us our debts because we have forgiven our debtors. The word debt there is not talking about a financial loan or anything like that. It is talking about sin. That is the word there that they're using here. In fact, in Luke's uh, translation or Luke's version of this exact same event, Luke says, forgive our sins for we ha also forgive everyone who sins against us. It's talking in past tense. God is going to forgive you of your sins because you have already forgiven those that hurt you and offended you. Do we understand the importance of forgiveness? If anybody's in this room today and is in need of forgiveness, I'm going to ask you to come forward as we sing this song. I want you to understand the importance of forgiveness. I want you to understand why we need to forgive somebody. So we're going to sing, I'll come to the altar. I'm going to ask the elders to come forward at this time. And if anybody needs to either be forgiven or to forgive someone else, come forward and we will pray with you.